It was a story with a terrible, tragic ending. For he had died not of wounds, but of poison. This was the Rommel of legend, the Desert Fox, as British journalists dubbed him. The tough, dynamic Panzer general, always in the front line. No unit, however small, could be sure when their general would appear and take personal command of them. Unorthodox tactics, speed and boldness on the battlefield, these became his hallmarks. Rommel. Even his British opponents came to hold him in awe and admiration as a clean adversary in a dirty war. And in Germany, the Nazi propaganda machine systematically exploited him as a national hero. He seemed to acquiesce, happily enough. But what were his real feelings about Nazism? What kind of man really lay behind the wartime legend? Erwin Rommel was born in 1891 in the South German state of Württemberg, in the country town of Heidenheim. Heidenheim lay far from the bleak plains of Prussia and her militaristic tradition, yet Prussia dominated Germany, a country only united 20 years earlier. The old monastery at Weingarten, then the depot of the 124th Württemberg Infantry Regiment. On the 19th of July, 1910, Rommel entered his profession, a world of simplicities, unquestioning obedience, duty to the Kaiser and the fatherland. Rommel himself, middle class and in a Württemberger regiment, was doubly an outsider in an imperial army dominated by Prussian aristocrats. He threw himself into his work with total dedication. He preferred to stay in barracks studying while his fellow subalterns were out on the town. No wonder they found him a bit too serious. Like his future adversary Montgomery, he neither drank nor smoked. In 1911, he met his future wife, Lucie Maria Molin. Theirs was to be the closest of friendships. Throughout his campaigns, he was to write to her every night, letters which reveal a Rommel his army never knew. The Great War, and Rommel, although only a subaltern, became a legend. He was a cunning tactician brave and resourceful, indifferent to hardship and danger. The outsider had joined an elite now, the elite of the battlefield. After fighting in the fast-moving German invasion of France in 1914, he commanded an assault unit of mountain troops in Romania. But it was when the German and Austrian armies in Italy launched their offensive at Caporetto in 1917 that Rommel's great opportunity came. He penetrated 12 miles into the Italian defences, captured a key mountain, and took 9,000 prisoners. It was a brilliant feat, the precursor in style of his desert victories 25 years later. And it brought him the Pour le Mérite, Germany's highest military decoration. Germany embittered by defeat, and for Rommel, stagnation in an army limited by the Versailles Treaty to 100,000 men. And while the Reichswehr drilled, German democracy sickened and died, and Hitler came to power. Like every German soldier, Rommel took a personal oath of loyalty to Hitler. As a simple, perhaps too simple, patriot, he wanted to see Germany great again. In 1935, Hitler inspected Rommel's mountain battalion, the first time they'd met. But before the inspection took place, there'd been a minor row. Rommel had refused to turn out his men until Hitler's SS guard was removed from the front of his parade. In the circumstances, it was an act of some moral courage on the part of the obscure little colonel of mountain troops. Yet, Rommel did not look deep into political issues. He was wrapped up in his own profession and family life. His only son, Manfred, recalls. 
my father was a man with a, a simple but very clear morale. He, uh, he was a mathematician. I think he read very few novels in his life. He was not for fiction, but he could uh, reckon most complicated things. And this was something like a natural film. He was a very tolerant father, I would say, a modern father. His conception of a soldier's duty was narrow but stern. As commandant of a war academy, he told his cadets, Be an example to your men, both in your duty and your private life. Never spare yourself in your endurance of fatigue and privation, and let your troops see that you don't. In 1937, Rommel published a book on tactics. It was to prove more fateful than a battle lost or won, for it earned him the personal patronage of Adolf Hitler. September 1939, the German invasion of Poland, the opening campaign of the Second World War. And Rommel was now at Hitler's side, a member of his personal staff. Did Rommel, a man brought up in strict Protestant moral principle, feel any qualms about this invasion or the man who'd launched it? Rommel was not and never had been a member of the Nazi party. But as a soldier, he'd been trained to unquestioning loyalty to the state. And Hitler was the state. Rommel was politically naive. To him, Hitler was a well-meaning patriot. The unpleasant aspect of Nazism he attributed to Hitler's associates. Just like the British cabinet of the 1930s, Rommel was completely deceived as to Hitler's fundamental evil. May the 10th, 1940. Hitler's long-awaited offensive against France and the Low Countries. Rommel now commanded the 7th Panzer Division, his first major command in the field. He was completely happy. Boyish in his enthusiasm, he wrote to his wife, Dearest Lou, everything wonderful so far. I'm way ahead of my neighbors. I'm completely hoarse from orders and shouting. Had a bare three hours sleep. Breakthrough. The Panzers rolled on deep into the French rear. For Germany, for Rommel, this was the springtime of war. The unorthodox and risky German plan was working beautifully. To Rommel's south, another panzer division reached the channel at Abbeville on 20th of May, splitting the Allied armies in two. But on that day, Rommel himself was counterattacked, alarming Hitler and the high command. They halted the Panzers for three days instead of allowing them to sweep up the coast behind the Allies. It was a decisive blunder, giving the British and French time to fall back on Dunkirk and the waiting rescue ships. The 5th of June, the Germans swung south to finish France off. Another breakthrough for Rommel, another exciting chase. The advance went straight across country over roadless and trackless fields, through hedges, fences, and high cornfields. Dearest Lou, your birthday was a thoroughly successful day. We laid about us properly. Two glorious days in pursuit, a roaring success. 45 miles yesterday. On the 10th of June, 1940, Rommel reached the open sea. St. Valery en Co. Here, next day, Rommel trapped the British 51st Highland Division and a French corps. He wrote home. The battle is over here. Today, one corps commander and four divisional commanders presented themselves before me in the market square of St. Valery, having been forced by me to surrender. Wonderful moments. Barely seven days after these scenes of surrender in St. Valery, 
Rommel was to crown his success by capturing the great port of Cherbourg. France was down. Rommel was proud of Germany's triumph, elated with his own exploits. It was almost as if war were just an exciting game. The Italian colony of Libya, February 1941, where German troops, novices in the desert, were arriving piecemeal. Hitler had sent them under Rommel's command to save Libya from total conquest by the British, who destroyed the Italian defenders. It was a desperate situation, but Hitler had chosen his generals well. Rommel sorted out his scratch army like a sergeant major with an awkward squad. German and British high commands alike expected him to stand on the defensive. Instead, dearest Lou, we've been attacking with dazzling success. There'll be consternation among our masters in Tripoli and Rome, perhaps in Berlin too. I took the risk against all orders and instructions because the opportunity seemed favorable. It was a self-portrait in a sentence. Rommel bundled the confused British back to the Egyptian frontier. A brilliant debut in independent command. The Western Desert. In spring 1942, it had resounded for two years to a kind of warfare never seen before or since. Mechanized armies maneuvering in an empty arena like football teams. Warfare of which Rommel was the master. War came to the desert because Italian Libya lay on the flank of the British Middle East Command, Egypt, the Suez Canal, and beyond the Persian Gulf oil fields. For Rommel's Africa Corps, this was a welcome lull. The pendulum of battle had come to rest at Gazala after a British winter offensive and another surprise counterstroke by Rommel. Rommel himself had now become a legend, even to the enemy, who thought more of him than of their own leaders. He brilliantly succeeded in his original mission. With only three German divisions at his back, plus Italians, he was keeping in play the main military effort of the British Empire. Beating him had become Winston Churchill's overmastering obsession. Difficulties. His units were always under strength. His Italian allies were equipped with obsolete and next to useless tanks. Their infantry was ill-trained and ill-led. The RAF and the Royal Navy constantly sank his supply ships. And then there was Mussolini, the Italian dictator, and the Italian high command. In theory, Rommel's superiors. In fact, only the source of endless broken promises over supplies. Between Rommel and Kesselring, the German commander-in-chief South, relations were by no means always genial. And above Kesselring, Hitler and the high command fought only of their war in Russia. As Rommel wrote later, They failed to see the importance of the African theater. They did not realize that with relatively small means we could have won victories in the Near East which in their strategic and economic value would have far surpassed the conquest of the Don Basin. Ahead of us lay territories containing an enormous wealth of raw materials, which could have freed us from all our anxieties about oil. Nevertheless, Berlin and Rome authorized an offensive, but Rommel was told to advance no further than the Egyptian frontier. On the 26th of May, 1942, Rommel rode out to the attack at the head of Panzer Army Africa. His greatest desert battle had begun. This was the plan as sketched here by Rommel himself. It was typically simple, bold, but based on inaccurate information. His aim was to sweep round the British flank and north to the sea. The 8th Army at Gazala was to be surrounded and destroyed, even though it heavily outnumbered him in tanks. His panzer division swept through the surprised British units in their path. But then came an unpleasant shock. The 8th Army's new American-built Grant tanks with their 75mm guns. British weight of numbers began to tell. Rommel's offensive stalled. He was now in desperate peril, deep in the British rear, almost out of fuel and ammunition. 
His staff advised him to retreat without delay. Instead, Rommel himself brought up the vital supply trucks through a sandstorm and guided them through a gap in the British armour. He'd saved his battle by quick thinking and sheer personal leadership. But the problem remained of his long and vulnerable supply line round the south of the British defences. Rommel solved the problem by one of his most brilliantly unorthodox strokes. He breached the British defences from the British side and opened up a direct lifeline to his base. Then he withdrew his army into a bridgehead in the British minefields. His cunningly sighted defences, including the lethal 88mm anti-aircraft guns used in an anti-tank role, massacred the ill-organised British counterstrokes. Now Rommel took the offensive again. His first objective, the Free French in Bir Hakim, the southern hinge of the British defence. This was the finish of the Ghazala line. Rommel drove forward relentlessly towards Tobruk and the sea. On his way, he collided with what was left of the British armour. After two days fighting, Rommel left the 8th Army virtually without tanks. Dearest Lou, the battle has been won and the enemy is breaking up. We're now mopping up encircled remnants of their army. I needn't tell you how delighted I am. I've been living in my car for days and have had no time to leave the battlefields in the evenings. But there was one more prize in Libya he meant to have, the British base of Tobruk. garrison of 30,000 men surrendered next day. Dearest Lou, Tobruk, it was a wonderful battle. I must get a few hours sleep now after all that's happened. How much I think of you. Hitler has made me a field marshal. I would much rather he'd given me one more division. At 50, he was the youngest field marshal in the German army. To his troops, he issued an order of the day. Your spirit of attack has cost the enemy the core of his field army, which was standing poised for an offensive. Soldiers of the Panzer Army Africa. Now for the complete destruction of the enemy. I shall call on you for one more great effort. But according to the original plan, this was now the time for Rommel to halt. Instead, he won Hitler's sanction to invade Egypt. The momentum of victory pulled him onwards. El Alamein. Here, in the last days of June 1942, the Eighth Army was preparing to give battle to Rommel again. To the east, only 60 miles beyond, lay the prize Rommel sought, Alexandria, the Nile Delta. To the west, an exhausted Panzer Army only kept moving by its tireless commander. On the 1st of July, 1942, Rommel attacked, up with his leading troops as usual. But this time, he faced a new opponent, General Sir Claude Auchinleck, the Commander-in-Chief Middle East, who'd taken over direct command of the 8th Army. Auchinleck told his troops, the enemy is stretching to his limit and thinks we're a beaten army. He hopes to take Egypt by bluff. Show him where he gets off. It was the beginning of a three-week duel between Rommel and Auchinleck, thrust and counter-thrust. Auchinleck, big, burly, resolute, was determined to force Rommel onto the defensive. And unlike Rommel, he could call on fresh divisions. Day by day, Rommel felt Auchinleck's attacks gradually wrest from his grasp the initiative he'd wielded for so long. Hopes of victory faded, anguish mounted. He poured out his feelings in his letters to his wife the 17th of July, 1942. Things are going downright badly for me at the moment. 
The enemy is using his superiority, especially in infantry, to destroy the Italian formations one by one, and the German formations are much too weak to stand alone. It's enough to make one weep. The 18th of July, 1942. Dearest Lou, yesterday was a particularly hard and critical day. We pulled through again, but it can't go on like this for long, otherwise the front will crack. Militarily, this is the most difficult period I've ever been through. You know what an incurable optimist I am, but there are situations where everything is dark. The first battle of Alamein ended in stalemate. Rommel had seen all his triumphs come to nothing. His ultimate prize, only empty sand. It was the turning point in the Desert War. It was a turning point, too, for Rommel himself. The old Rommel, that boyish optimist to whom war seemed almost a game, was no more. Troubles began to dog him. After 19 months in the desert, his health was giving way. Fainting fits, chronic stomach and intestinal catarrh, nasal diphtheria. September, home leave. After a fresh defeat, this time at Montgomery's hands at Alam Halfa. Amid the shadows of disappointment and failure came the consolation of his martial baton from Hitler's hands. Yet Hitler was not really interested in Rommel's African campaign, only in Russia. Then a sick man, Rommel went into hospital in the Austrian Alps. He could only wait in impotence and foreboding for Montgomery's expected grand offensive and think of his soldiers 1,500 miles away in the desert. Nine p.m. on the 23rd of October, 1942. The Second Battle of Alamein fought over this now empty sweep of desert. Within 24 hours, Rommel was back with his troops. But strive as he might, he was helpless in the face of the massive enemy superiority in men, tanks, and aircraft. With remorseless purpose, Montgomery ground the Panzer Army to pieces. To Rommel, now, war was no longer what it once had seemed. Dearest Lou, the battle is going very heavily against us. We're simply being crushed by the enemy's weight. I've made an attempt to salvage part of the army. I wonder if it will succeed. At night I lie open-eyed, racking my brains for a way out of this plight for my poor troops. We are facing very difficult days, perhaps the most difficult that a man can undergo. The dead are lucky. It's all over for them. For 11 days, the Panzer Army held on. Then, to avoid total destruction, Rommel gave the order to retreat. But just as the army began to slip away, there arrived a telegram from the Führer, Adolf Hitler, ordering him to stand fast. His first reaction was that he said, I must obey. I am challenging for my soldiers always that they obey. I must also obey to my commander, supreme commander, commander in chief. And uh, during the night, I tried to persuade him and was supported in the next morning by Field Marshal Kettering. He also had the opinion that this order was not possible to execute. So the retreat went on, back and back, over ground once traversed in the exhilaration of victory, back to Benghazi, back to Tripoli itself, back to Tunisia, to join the Axis troops now fighting the Anglo-American forces under Eisenhower. 
1,400 miles to retreat. But Montgomery pursued him only with caution, lest, like his predecessors, he too fell victim to a thunderbolt counterstroke. Rommel's very legend served as his army's shield. For Rommel himself, this was a time of bitterness, even despair. In March 1943, he flew to plead with Hitler to evacuate Africa while there was still time. But Hitler was to refuse. Anger was to spark between the two men, and Rommel was to be sent on sick leave after the interview. Two months later, the army in Africa was to surrender to the Allies. For Rommel, the conclusion of the African campaign marked the end of something else too, his trust in Hitler. The Channel Coast of France. On the last day of 1943, Rommel was appointed to command the army group charged with its defense against the coming Allied invasion, the very scene of his own triumphant attacks in 1940. He found a ramshackle, dispirited army, sketchy defenses, a grim professional challenge. Tirelessly, Rommel threw himself into surmounting it. Vice Admiral Ruger was a colleague when you've been in the Navy for almost 30 years and very independent mostly, and then you find yourself suddenly in an army staff, you are rather reserved. But after a few days, I said to myself, this man is so important, you have to keep notes, to put it down in writing. Once he told me that he never had sent a man into a certain death, and he very quickly got into contact with the men everywhere and they took up his ideas quickly better than the staffs because they saw here the practical men gave them something to do which was necessary useful for them which they could do with their hands with their feet and which would help them Rommel's asparagus. This is his own drawing of obstacles to prevent gliders landing. His new task called out all the practical ingenuity of a man who once had hoped to be an engineer. An explosive welcome below the high water mark. More of Rommel's own ideas. Week after week he was on the move, inspecting, suggesting, inspiring and minefields. His soldiers laid nearly six million mines. But Rommel was thinking of 50 million if he was given time. For Rommel saw the only hope of success lay in halting the invasion forces on the coast itself and then Dunkirking them by prompt local counterstrokes, the very strategy that Montgomery most feared. Rommel, unlike his orthodox colleagues, was open-minded and adaptable enough to recognize that the mobile strategy of the past was ruled out by Allied air power. Yet, all that hectic spring, Rommel had another problem on his mind, one that could not be solved by practical ingenuity or dynamic energy. For he had become convinced that Hitler was leading Germany to catastrophe, that the war must be ended, and his closest colleague in France, his own chief of staff, Hans Speidel, was a member of the secret German opposition. This was planning to depose Hitler and negotiate an armistice with Britain and America. Speidel was a fellow Württemberger. He and Rommel used to take long walks together in the park of the Chateau de la Roche-Guillon, their headquarters overlooking the River Seine. As the two men paced the grass and talked, out of earshot of eavesdroppers, Rommel sought an answer to his moral conflict. Where did a soldier's duty lie when his country was at war? Was it treason to seek an armistice with the enemy in defiance of his own leader? What about his oath of loyalty? Was there a higher duty for a soldier than to obey? Rommel would repeat over and over again Hitler's own words in his book Mein Kampf that rebellion was a duty when a nation was being led to destruction. 
On the 5th of June, Rommel set off to see Hitler, but only to ask for more troops. For Rommel believed that he must defeat the invasion first, and only then would a peace against Hitler's will become possible. But next day... The Normandy invasion. Rommel's plan to Dunkirk the Allies on the beaches failed, partly because he was shackled by Hitler's long-distance control. Within a week, Rommel was signaling, the strength of the enemy on land is increasing more quickly than our reserves can reach the front. The enemy has complete control over the battle area and up to 60 miles behind the front, as I personally and officers of my staff have repeatedly proved. Since the enemy can cripple our mobile formations with his air force by day, our position is becoming extraordinarily difficult. I request that the Führer be informed of this. Rommel. Yet, just as at Alamein, Rommel strove to save a doomed army by sheer force of personal leadership. Perhaps he found the battlefield a refuge from his other problems. a headquarters bunker at Margeval, near Soissons. On the 17th of June, 1944, it saw a bitter confrontation between Hitler and Rommel and von Rundstedt, the Commander-in-Chief West. Hitler now lived in a dream world, completely blind to realities. Rommel, blunt to the point of rudeness, tried to convince him that the Normandy battle was lost. He urged him to sue for peace. General Spidel was a witness to what followed. It's when Hitler opposed Rommel's explanations and demands and described them as unreliable, Rommel pointed out sharply that orders were only given from the conference table and that there was a complete lack of any assessment of the situation as seen from the front. He said to Hitler, and I quote, you demand that we should have confidence, yet we ourselves are not trusted. Hitler grew pale, but at first he didn't say anything in return. After repeated interchanges, Hitler cut short any discussion and said, don't trouble yourself about politics, but about your invasion front. Rommel's mind was made up at last. He decided to ask the Western Allies for an armistice as soon as possible. On the 15th of July, he sent a final message to Hitler. The unequal struggle is approaching its end. It is urgently necessary for the proper conclusion to be drawn from this situation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army Group, I feel myself in duty bound to speak plainly on this point. Rommel. But two days later, on this road near saint foy de Montgomery in Normandy, Rommel's car was hit by RAF cannon fire. With the driver badly wounded, it careered off course, turned over by this bridge, and threw Rommel out onto the road. He was taken to this hospital at Le Vesinet near Paris, and operated on for multiple fractures of the skull. On the 20th of July, while Rommel was lying in the hospital annex, Hitler was wounded, but not killed, by a bomb planted inside his East Prussian headquarters. In Berlin, there was a simultaneous attempt at a coup d'etat. It failed. How deeply had Rommel been involved in the plot? Hans Speidel. Feldmarschall Rommel Field Marshal Rommel was let into the assassination plot only very late through the cousin of Count Stauffendel, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. von Hofacker, but without giving the date. You know that Rommel was against an assassination attempt for ethical reasons. But then fate intervened Rommel was severely wounded. Rommel's home at Herlingen, near Hume. It was at his own insistence that he was moved here in August from France in order to avoid capture by the advancing Allies. 
Still suffering from the effects of his head injuries, he convalesced quietly with his family. But meanwhile, the Gestapo was gradually closing in. In Berlin, a so-called People's Court subjected the brutally tortured leaders of the July bomb plot to Nazi justice. Most were hanged. On the 7th of September, Rommel received the news that Hans Speidel, his own chief of staff, had been arrested. A month later, Rommel himself was ordered to Berlin, ostensibly for an interview. He refused on health grounds. Shortly after, Admiral Ruger visited him. He invited me to stay overnight, and we had a long talk. Uh, we two only about the situation. And he... Uh, said something I understood later only. Uh, he told me that uh, they had called him up from Berlin. He was to go to Berlin. And he said, I uh, am not yet fit, and I wouldn't uh, arrive there alive. And I thought it was his state of health, because he had had four fractures of the skull. But later, I realized that Hitler never could afford to put a man like Rommel for people's court they would have killed him on the way to Berlin. Rommel and his wife could only wait. On the 13th of October, Rommel was informed by telephone that two generals from Berlin were to visit him on the following day. Rommel's 15-year-old son, Manfred, also arrived that morning on leave from his anti-aircraft battery. In that morning, I had a long walk together with my father and on this walk, he told me that two generals had announced their arrival and uh, that it will depend. Either they will give him a new command on the Eastern Front or it will be the People's Court which is awaiting for him. My father changed his civil clothes and put on his Africa uniform, which I, he liked very much to wear, was much more comfortable than the general, stiff general's uniform the Germans had with a stiff collar. And then at 12 o'clock, the two generals came. They asked my father if they can speak with him under six A's alone. I left them, Aldinger left them too, we went upstairs. And after 20 minutes, half an hour, I heard my father coming up, going at first to my mother. Then he went out and came into my room and told me I had just to say to your mother, that I shall be dead in 20 minutes. He was very composed. He was sober, quiet. He was a little bit pale, maybe. But he spoke very clearly and uh, very reflective. He said to die by the hand of one's own people is very hard. But there is no other way. It's the best thing to do to go with them. The two generals accused me in the name of, Fuhr, of the Führer that I committed high treason. They brought poison with them. Hitler is offering me to die by this poison in, um, because I have had my merits in North Africa. And in the case I do that, the usual measures against the family, this was automatic arrest in the concentration camp, will not be taken and against my staff neither. And therefore, I've decided to go with them. They told me that I shall have a state funeral 
They asked me where they wanted to do it in Berlin. I told them it's more comfortable to do this in Ulm. And then he asked me to look for Captain Aldinger. I called him, he came up. Aldinger was Rommel's aide. He told him, Everything is arranged to the last detail. The generals have brought the poison. You, Aldinger, will be telephoned in about 30 minutes, and you'll be informed that on the journey to Ulm, to a conference, I have suffered a stroke. When he put on his coat, he asked his son and me, deeply moved and upset, whether he should take his paybook and wallet. But as always in difficult situations, he showed that he was composed and he had himself under control. Then Rommel walked out of the house to the gate where the two generals were waiting. Without words, Rommel shook hands with his son and Captain Aldinger. They watched the car drive away and out of sight. For 20 minutes, Frau Rommel and the others waited in the silent house until the telephone rang. At the funeral service in the town hall of Ulm, the oration was read by von Rundstedt, Germany's senior soldier. Rommel's family had to listen to a masterpiece of cynicism by the propaganda ministry. It referred to Rommel as this tireless fighter in the cause of the Führer, imbued with the national socialist spirit. His heart, it ended, belonged to the Führer. Next day, Rommel's ashes were buried in the churchyard at Herlingen. For Frau Rommel, in her grief, there was the comfort of a personal message from the Führer, which read, Accept my sincerest sympathy for the heavy loss you have suffered with the death of your husband. The name of Field Marshal Rommel will be forever linked with the heroic battles in North Africa. Adolf Hitler. Probably a noble soldier, yet some historians feel that when confronted with his crimes against the Fuhrer, Rommel should have demanded a public trial and struck a last blow for humanity by denouncing Hitler. His proper course of action is endlessly debatable. That he would have been given the chance to speak is doubtful, and that such an action would have placed his friends and family in jeopardy is certain. Exactly what it is that Rommel felt when he went to his death can only be imagined. He was driven away, wearing his Africa Corps leather jacket and brandishing his field marshal's baton. Whether his choice was heroic or not, the fact is that he had but an hour to decide. And it's said that when Frau Rommel viewed her husband's remains, she saw on his face an expression of utter contempt. That expression is frozen in his death mask. I'm Peter Graves for the A&E Cable Network. Until next time on Biography. Next on a and &E, it's a painful scrub down for James as he tries to become a city slicker in All Creatures Great and Small.